This time of the year, we have a female cardinal. Sometimes she's joined by a male cardinal starting to attack either our upstairs uh, bedroom windows or mirrors and windows on our car. It's uh, a bit annoying, especially when you're trying to work from home, but it's also a bit disturbing because I always worry that uh, the birds will smash themselves into the windows so hard that they will actually kill themselves. And uh, in the past couple of weeks, I had uh, two people, uh, Sheila Siegel and David Joy, write to me asking how to deal with this kind of behavior. David actually sent us a video and he called it the Kamikaze Cardinal. Uh, this is not abnormal behavior for cardinals this time uh, of the year. And here are a few things that uh, work for us. So the first year when the female cardinal was attacking mirrors in our car, we realized that she was launching herself from the cedar hedge, from that side of the where the car was parked and was smashing herself in the mirror just on one side. So we moved the car forward away from the cedar hedge and that solved uh, the problem. The next year, I guess it was the same uh, female cardinal she decided to perch herself on the mirror and then attack her reflection in the window of the car so that was a bit trickier we ended up throwing a blanket uh, on that side and that helped as well uh, with our bedroom windows i just closed the blind and that cut out the reflection completely and the cardinal moved on but in sheila's situation she has a female cardinal attacking her sliding doors so closing curtains uh, on the inside didn't really work so I suggested that Sheila buys um, a roll of uh, window screen you can get it at any of your hardware stores and then attaches that uh, screen on the outside you know not the whole door but just the area where the cardinal uh, is banging herself into and you know what Sheila just wrote to me saying that it's actually helping so keep these uh, tactics in mind because very often in the spring when uh, birds start their uh, breeding season robins and bluebirds and cardinals attack their own reflection in all sorts of uh, mirrors and windows that they can find and this is what you can do to stop them speaking of uh, birds attacking windows last year pamela got woken up by bluebirds at the same time every day they were scratching on her windows so she was wondering whether they were simply picking up a dead bugs and insects that died there overnight. Hi, Pamela. Well, I've certainly been woken up by both Gila woodpeckers in my Baja home precisely 7 o'clock every morning without fail, and then later in the spring by northern flickers tapping noisily at exactly the same time at our house on Vancouver Island. The former was tapping on a wooden railing in the roof, while the latter was pecking on a metal ventilator on my other roof. The flicker sounded just like a machine gun inside the bedroom. Both problems were resolved by affixing metal cage wire over the selected targets, basically exclusion. But bluebirds feeding upon insects that died in the windows overnight, that would be a new one for me. First, let's state the obvious. Bluebirds do like eating insects. For instance, they relish consuming mealworms, especially live wriggling ones offered in backyard feeders. As for foraging methods though, according to a study in 1996, the vast majority of insects are caught by eastern bluebirds flying from a perch to the ground. Rarely, they're caught by catching them in mid-air or by hovering. Some do walk, though, and glean, which covers the behavior that you observed, but no mention of them collecting insects dying overnight on windows. Keep in mind that most birds are incredibly opportunistic and are always on the lookout for food. I suppose things could have been worse. You could have had a pair of nesting crows in your backyard. Now that's a noise that one could do without. In the winter, in my avian restaurant, I only serve black oil sunflower seeds in shells. Well, the weather fluctuates so much here and you have to be so careful when serving hulled sunflower seeds in tube feeders. But then, of course, this time of the year, and it's been so cold here, the birds are eating so much that there is huge accumulation of black oil sunflower seed shells on the ground. 
So what to do with all of them? Well, it turns out that sunflower plants, you know, the whole thing and its shells, uh, are actually allelopathic. It means that they naturally kill all sorts of weeds. You've probably experienced how fast they kill your grass under the bird feeders. So consider using those shells as a natural mulch in your either vegetable or flower garden. So right now you can either rake them or shovel them and pile them somewhere, you know, away from your bird feeders until you are ready to use them. It takes them about three years to decompose, so don't worry, they're not just gonna disappear in the next couple of months. And then when putting them down in your gardens, uh, make sure to provide a couple of inches of space around the plant. And then because it's such a wonderful natural uh, weed killer and mulch, uh, don't mix it with your compost. Who does not love the song of a bird? Recent studies have told us that being surrounded by singing birds in one's environment can make us happier, healthier, and even live longer. But would you feel the same way if the source of that song was from a bird in a cage? Well, some people out there in the world do. According to a recent study, bird singing contests are now a major driver in the global songbird trade. Contests take place in no less than 19 countries, but are most prevalent in Southeast Asia. This is not a new phenomenon, folks. For hundreds of years, people have been keeping wild birds, and it's often deeply ingrained in certain cultures. And as far back as the 14th century, India, Japan, and China held bird singing contests. While most birds can be bought in a market for just a few bucks, the most accomplished birds, the ones with the most stamina, can sell for as much as $15,000 US. No surprise either considering that the prize money for some contests, such as the President's Cup in Indonesia, can go as high as $80,000 US. Contests usually start at 7 in the morning before it gets too hot. Each competition lasts about 10 to 15 minutes, and the judges decide the winners based on a combination of songs, plumage, and movement. Winning these contests is not just about money either. Family pride comes into it. One chap in surname keeps no less than 200 singing birds in his house, much to the chagrin of his wife. From a conservation point of view, these contests are not a good thing. While some birds are captive bred, many are live trapped. The white rump shama, brown headed barbet, and the orange headed thrush are among the top five most popular species for singing contests, and all three of them have a declining populations. As if the birds on our planet did not have enough to worry about. Last episode, we talked about American robins, and you know, I have never seen them here in the winter, but strangely enough, a number of people from Ottawa and Montreal area where it's, you know, so cold, uh, wrote to me last week saying that they're seeing robins and they're also surprised, but all those robins seem to have found a good source of wild berries, so they're quite happy to stick around. Now, tell me, when you put up a new bird feeder or when you move your bird feeders to a new location, which bird shows up first? For me, without fail, it's black-capped chickadees. I call them scouts. I know when one chickadee shows up, the rest of the gang will follow. So today, it's B for black-capped chickadees. Black-capped chickadees are found pretty much everywhere in Canada and in most northern states with their relatives mountain chickadees on the west coast and then anything uh, you know south of uh, Carolinas is Carolina chickadee. It's not that easy to distinguish between uh, black-capped chickadees and Carolina chickadees. It is said that uh, the black-capped ones are large and have you know longer wings and tails but at the same time, you know, the further north you travel, the larger black-capped chickadees become, and then the further south you travel, the smaller Carolina chickadees uh, get, and then anywhere in between, they're kind of the same. So here I have a video by Susan Rogg here, who has Carolina chickadees in Florida, and a video from my backyard of black-capped chickadees. Males and females look pretty much the same with males, uh, a little bit larger with longer wings and tails. Actually, this time of the year is a great way to spot which one is male and which one is female because uh, they tend to flock and hang out all together. So if you get a number of them at your feeders, you can probably distinguish one from the other. 
black cap chickadees attitude towards food is the kind of attitude you want your child to have they happily eat whatever you serve them and they never complain it doesn't matter whether it's a niger seed black oil sunflower seeds safflower suet peanuts they eat it all. You might have noticed that chickadees don't really sit there on your feeders for hours like goldfinches, but they rather pick a, a seed or a peanut and take it somewhere else and eat it there where it's safe, or they stash it for later. In the winter, their diet is actually 50% bugs and 50% seeds, though I don't really know where they find bugs when it's so cold outside. And then in the summer, during their breeding season, it's 80% bugs and 20% 20% seeds. That's why you might not see as many chickadees in the summer at your feeders. And you know, they absolutely love all those uh, creepy crawlies when you, you know, lift a, a, a rotting branch or a log. So you building uh, brush piles or tossing your uh, Christmas tree somewhere in your backyard actually provides a feast for your chickadees. Chickadees will also happily eat seeds from goldenrod, hamlock, blackberries, blueberries, raspberries, and even berries from poison ivy. Black-capped chickadees are monogamous, and in the fall, when they form flocks, breeding pairs will actually stay together during the winter, and their bond can last for several years. So divorce rates are pretty low among uh, black-capped chickadees. Uh, both male and females uh, look for nesting sites, and they will actually carve a cavity together. They will also take to a nesting box, especially if it's filled with wood chips. It's the female that builds the nest and she incubates the eggs, but the male does feed her and helps her out with uh, chores like cleaning the nest and feeding the young. The hatchlings are very hungry at first. They require about 14 feedings an hour. Imagine how much work that is. And then the chicks fledge when they're about 16 days old, but they still stick around with their parents and the parents feed them until they're about three weeks old. A couple of interesting facts about black capped chickadees. On average, they live 2.5 years, and then when it gets really cold, they like to stash their food so their brain can actually grow up to 30% to remember where they put what. And then also, when it's really cold outside, they can drop their body temperature by several degrees, which stops them from freezing to death. Well, it's time to say goodbye. Our photo contest is still open. The theme is true love. And our next guest on the bird alphabet is the common yellow throat. So if you have any pictures or videos that you would like to share with us, send them over. Well, goodbye for now. I'll see you in two weeks.